All right, uh, great. So uh, the last talk of the semester, last Monday seminar, uh, uh, Sumega Grad from Harvard is going to tell us about uh, uh, memory sample trade-offs for learning. Yeah, thanks, Avi, uh, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, so today I'll be talking about two of the joint works with Ran and Avishai where we basically develop an extractor based approach to proving memory sample trade offs for learning. The, the main question here is that is learning feas infeasible under memory constraints uh, with increasing scale of learning problems and same bounded memory on phone devices, etc. It is becoming not only philosophically important, but practically important to understand this question. And uh, secondly, uh, many for example, many learning algorithms these days try to learn a concept or hypothesis class by modeling it as a neural network. And the uh, al algorithm basically keeps in memory some neural network and updates the weights when new samples arrive. And the memory used is the size of the network. And this is a low memory algorithm if the network size is small. And it would be uh, nice to see what kind of hypothesis classes can uh, such uh, low memory algorithms uh, learn? I guess I guess that the sizes of the networks are huge, but uh, also the number of samples is huge, yeah. right? So it's still, yeah, mostly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So small is small relative to you know. <laughs> um, but the question is whether you only remember that or you you need to remember more. Yeah. Yeah, so in 2014, Shamir, and in 2015, Steinhardt, Valiant, and Weger asked this question of, can one prove unconditional lower bounds on the number of sample need, samples needed for learning under memory constraints in the streaming setting, where the samples are viewed one by one in a stream? So just a brief description of the learning model. A learner is trying to learn an unknown function f, which, is, which was chosen from an hypothesis class. Uh, and it is trying to learn this from a stream of samples of the form A comma, the evaluation of F on A. And uh, these samples uh, arrive one by one. Uh, let's look at a toy example for, uh, for, for a learning problem, which is called uh, the parity learning problem. So here an unknown function f is uh, chosen uniformly at random from the set of n bit strings. That is the function f is represented by an n bit string. And this is unknown to the uh, learner. And then a learner tries to learn this fu function f from a stream of samples uh, of the form a comma b, where a is, to, a is another randomly chosen, uh, uniformly randomly chosen n bit string and b is the inner product of a with f that is it is some i a i times f i mod two. Uh, so, so in other words, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. So in other words, learner gets random binary linear equations in f one to f n, uh, where f one to f n is unknown, uh, and these equations arrive one by one, and it needs to solve for the hidden f. So just clarifying, these uh, FIs are bits. That's, uh, I mean, so, usually, okay. yeah, it looks like functions, but they are just bits that you are trying to learn. The linear combi the hidden linear combination. Yes, yeah, thank you. So so let's try learning here. Uh, there is a five, a five bit uh, string that is unknown to you, uh, which is represented by f1 to f5 and uh, i will give you some equations and ask you not to write down those equations uh, and try to uh, just uh, figure out what f is using your brain memory which i suppose is bound am i the only one that can't hear all of a sudden yeah, I also could. Yeah, I'm not saying anything. I'm just. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry.
So any guesses? Okay. Two, three. So I, I gave you a lot. Usually it can just solve for with uh, five equations, but I gave you many more equations and still uh, it is hard to uh, learn the hidden F. Uh, and the answer is this. And usually even if you would try to guess just a single bit, it would be hard for you. So let's look at some of the parity learners. Uh, one way to solve for the hidden vector f is, for example, writing down the equations. That is, you 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 just store order n samples, and uh, because these are chosen uniformly at random from n bit strings with high probability, these will span the n dimensional sub uh, n dimensional space, and you would be able to so solve you these independent linear equations using Cauchy elimination. This requires order n square memory. And then the second uh, parity learner is you just try all possibilities of f. So at, at, a, at a given time, you just store your current guess for f and check for the next order in samples, whether this f uh, could have generated the next order in samples. And then you keep on going over all the possibilities. So this requires just order in memory, but it requires exponential number of samples to learn. So you here we have a, a, a memory expensive algorithm, but here we have a sample expensive algorithm. And then the question is, is this trade-off between memory and the number of samples necessary? Uh, so in 2016, Ran has had this breakthrough result, which proved that any algorithm for parity learning of size n uh, with memory less than n squared by 25 bits requires exponential number of samples to learn. And uh, so, so this is basically uh, it, you, it, the, the amount of memory needed to learn is quadratic in the memory used to store a hypothesis, which is just n bits. Another way to see this result is that any algorithm for parity learning uh, either requires n squared by 25 bits or exponential number of samples to learn, just thus justifying the name given to this area of uh, of research, which is memory sample trade-off. Uh, so you didn't specify the model. I guess you will. Uh, it, it, the model doesn't is not just doing linear operations. It can do whatever it wants as long as it doesn't have too much memory, right? Yeah. So it just like the only restriction is uh, the memory, and and it, the samples are ar arriving in the stream. So if you want to. Uh, remember a sample, you will need to store it in your memory. So, so if you want to remember some uh, crazy function of your sample, like uh, the, you know, the, the logarithm of it uh, truncated to 10 bits, that's also you are allowed to do. Yeah. So the main motivation is from learning theory, which I have expressed before. And then there is a very, very, very fascinating application of these results in bounded storage cryptography. So for uh, bounded storage cryptography, where uh, we study cryptographic protocols that are secure against memory bounded adversaries. So for example, uh, uh, Ran's parity result gives, gives us a cryptographic scheme to share uh, messages, messages between two secret part, uh, two, two parties uh, such that uh, the secret key used is n bit, long, n bit long, and it takes n units of time to encrypt and decrypt each message, whereas uh, this scheme provides unconditional security uh, against an attacker of memory size less than n squared by 25 bits, as long as the number of messages uh, exchanged are exponential. And then uh, uh, the Obvious motivation also is from complexity theory, where time space lower bounds have been studied in many models. And this particular model of like uh, the streaming model allows us to prove a very strong time space lower bounds, a one pass streaming model. Then there has been a, a lot of work, uh, subsequent work, generalizing these memory sample trade offs. So for example, to learning sparse parities and to, uh, to a large class of learning problems. Um, uh, 
so then in 2018, with, in joint work with Ran and Avishai, uh, we developed an extractor-based approach to proving such memory time sample trade-offs for a large class of learning problems. So this paper implied all the previous results plus some new lower bounds, uh, for example, for learning uh, polynomial, uh, poly polynomials in F2. And this, used, uh, uh, this paper used a very similar proof technique to, uh, as that of Ran's, uh, uh, Ran's uh, uh, sequel paper in 2017. I want to mention that independently of our extractor-based result, there was another paper that proved uh, uh, related road bounds that, uh, for uh, uh, learning polynomials. Okay. So uh, then uh, uh, after our result, this paper by uh, Watsal, uh, Aaron and uh, Greg uh, uh, generalized the memory sample trade-offs to a problem in continuous optimization, where they showed that any algorithm performing linear regression uh, Any algorithm again, performing. Again, uh, we lost your voice, at least I did. Can you repeat uh, what you're saying about this slide? Yeah. So, um, so this, uh, uh, so th this paper proved that any algorithm performing linear regression over a stream of d-dimensional examples uses either a quadratic amount of memory or exhibits slower rate of convergence than can be achieved without the memory constraint. So. This, uh, so the motivation in this uh, paper is that first order methods, which are, uh, which are some uh, many times low memory algorithms uh, may have provably slower rate of convergence. Uh, so, so Mega, in this, in this result, uh, the main difference to all the previous results is it works over the reals as opposed to over uh, finite fields. Yeah. I think okay. the bigger difference is that there's an upper bound that's polynomial. I mean, another difference, because uh, you can do linear regression. It, yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. So yeah, so, so the, this the the lower bound, I think, more much more tricky. Yeah, exactly. Like, Thanks. to get a tight result. Yeah. Well, it was tricky enough. <laughs> but anyway, we'll, we'll see today. Mm -hmm. So then uh, there has been a lot of subsequent work. Uh, uh, in 2019, in uh, joint work with Ran and Avishai, we, uh, we extended these memory sample trade-offs to uh, learning under uh, when, when the uh, learner is allowed a second pass over the stream. Uh, this, I will talk about this result in the second part of the talk. And then there has been work uh, in uh, proving that distinguishing or testing under memory or communication constraints is hard, hard and then there is an interesting line of work that tries to uh, find a characterization of memory bounded learning uh, and finally into uh, this year uh, uma uh, ran and uh, we has a paper that comments on quantum memory bounded learning can you say something more about the characterization papers yeah so um, okay i'll try to say more i i I do not understand them well. So, for example, this paper, uh, uh, this paper, uh, basically tries to characterize the memory bounded learning uh, with uh, using a SQ dimension. That if the oh, sorry. who are the authors? SQ dimension of and who, who uh, GLM? Some of the some set of district. Oh, so. Yeah, sorry, I don't know. I know it's Shahar and I'll, I'll mail you the paper. Okay. Um, okay. So let's. Uh, so next, I want to dive down, dive into uh, uh, our result in 2018. So here we uh, we see the learning problem as a matrix. Uh, where let, let's say capital A and capital F are finite sets and this matrix is on A cross F. Uh, it's, it's a plus minus one, uh, plus one minus one matrix. And uh, the columns are basically indexed by the functions, uh, by, the, by the functions in the concept class that is capital F and then, or the hypothesis class. And then the rows are indexed by the possible samples. 
and the learning problem corresponding to the uh, to, to the matrix is as for, uh, to this matrix m is as follows a function f a function a function f is chosen uniformly at random from the concept class capital f that is a random column is chosen and then uh, and then a learner tries to learn f from a stream of samples of the form a comma uh, of the form a comma m a uh, comma f that is that a random at every time step a random row is chosen and then you are given the entry uh, at the matrix entry at this row comma the uh, the hidden uh, hidden function f and then at every step you keep on getting some of the uh, uh, entries of this hidden column and then you want to guess what the uh, unknown function f is And then we study this following property of this matrix M, uh, which we call the extractor property. So you look at any sub matrix of M of at least that has at least two to the minus K fraction of rows and two to the minus L fraction of columns. And then we, uh, we look at the average, uh, we look at the sub matrix and average out the matrix entries in the sub matrix. And we want to say that any sub matrix of M, which has this property that it has at least two to the minus K fraction of rows and at least two to the minus L fraction of columns has a bias of at most two to the minus R. That is the average uh, is at most two to the minus R in absolute value. If the matrix M satisfies this property, then we can prove that any learning algorithm requires either uh, omega KL memory or two to the omega R samples. Um, so this, uh, uh, so this, this is called an extractor property because it's, uh, it's, it's equivalent to, uh, it, up to some parameters change to, to saying that like you take a high mean entropy distribution on the, uh, on the concept class and a high mean entropy distribution on the sample, uh, on the sample class. And then your, uh, and then the output, uh, of this mid. Matrix M, if you uh, matrix M is uh, uh, is a uniform distribution, is a uniform bit. Well, you are going to say what is the what was the special case when you did parity? Uh, it may be useful, right? I mean, oh, okay. Different. Yeah, I was. Uh, that's yeah. good. So, so for example, in uh, in uh, in parity, this matrix would be an Hadamard matrix, and uh, And then, and then that uh, matrix uh, satisfies this uh, property of uh, uh, being that any sub matrix of say two to the minus uh, c times n fraction of rows and two to the minus c times n fr uh, fraction of the columns, where c is some small constant, has a bias of at most two to the minus c n. Okay, so because our proof uh, follows the, the proof of uh, Lan's paper in 17, I want to uh, mention, the, I mentioned the comparison with that paper. So Lan's paper in 2017 looked at, looked at the largest singular value of M. And then, uh, so, but, but we, we look at three parameters of this matrix M, which allows us to prove some finer, uh, finer uh, trade-offs for some uh, some uh, uh, some class of learning problems. So, for example, for large class of learning problems, uh, we can prove that in any learning algorithm requires either memory of size uh, omega log a times log f or exponential number of samples. Whereas Rand's result in 2017 uh, would have given a bound of or memory of at most a minimum of log a squared times log comma log f squared. So if 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 the matrix is uh, rectangular, our our techniques can get give us uh, uh, better lower bounds. So can you go back away, so Megan? Mm -hmm. Just say, I mean, just passing these logs. It's basically the number of bits describing a a, a, a function and the number of bits describing a sample. So yeah, you need either their product or uh, as memory or an exponential number of samples. 
Yeah, so a, this exponential number of samples can be thought of as like minimum of a comma f. Mm -hmm. order. Yeah. Okay, so uh, next uh, I will give, uh, I will describe two of the new lower bounds that we are able to prove in this uh, uh, in this paper. So uh, the, the first one is learning learning from uh, learn low degree polynomials. That is, uh, uh, a learner tries to learn uh, a, a learner tries to learn an n variate multilinear polynomial p of degree at most uh, d over f two. Uh, from random evaluations of p over f2 to the n that is at each time the the uh, the d, a d degree n variate uh, multilinear polynomial is hidden and then at every time step you get uh, you get a random uh, point from f2 to the n and the evaluation of p on, at that point and then uh, and then you want to learn what this p is and then we prove that uh, this uh, uh, this problem Problem requires either n to the d plus one memory or exponential number of samples, uh, and uh, uh, and then uh, so so if you if you look at the, the 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 property that we study, if the role of the samples and concept class is interchanged, then also that property would be true. So basically, the lower bounds that lower bounds for problems that we get from uh, our techniques. We can also prove uh, prove the same lower bounds for the transpose of uh, transpose of that matrix. Uh, so, for example, when the role of samples and functions is uh, exchanged. So, uh, an example of this is that we can prove that learning from low degree equations is also hard. That is, a learner tries to learn uh, an n bit uh, n bit function from random multilinear polynomials of degree at most t over f two. And this also requires either n to the d plus one memory or exponential number of samples. So uh, again, just passing the parameters, what what happens? I mean, it looks like you can get, let's say, cubic lower bounds on the memory as opposed to uh, quadratic lower bounds uh, before, yeah. but actually the size of the input also increased, right? Because uh, yeah. a polynomial of degree two uh, will require n square bits to be described. So that's yeah. the explanation of the uh, n to the d plus one is really the product of the sample size and and the function size as yes. before. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll interrupt for a second too, just because mm -hmm. I think some people don't know this area very well. I just wanted to say something, which is like that this was a real shock, I think, to a lot of people, me included, just this whole, the fact that you could get such strong lower bounds, unconditional and so tight that, you know, either you tr have to do the trivial thing and like run through all concepts until, <laughs> until you find the right one, which is the two to the end, or you have to do the only other obvious thing, which is to collect all your samples and then solve like with Gaussian elimination. And then normally we just can't prove lower bounds at all. Like, so it was, I think it was a real surprise that we, such, you know, starting from Ron's original paper that somehow you could exploit the fact that the, in, that the model, the samples are random um, to get, yeah, to prove unconditional bounds. Yeah. There's Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so let's look. Let's look at uh, uh, the proof overview. Uh, so uh, to prove uh, to prove the result as done by previous papers, we uh, we model the learning uh, learning algorithm as a branching program. So a learning algorithm that sees uh, m samples is modeled by a m length branching program. Uh, so a branching program has vertices that are divided into layers, and each layer has d vertices. Where here uh, d represents uh, d is equal to two to the two to the memory of the learning algorithm, and then the uh, each layer represents a time step, and each vertex each vertex represents a memory state of the learner, and the edges are present only from layer i to layer i plus one, uh, and so for example there is an edge from vertex uh, from vertex uh, from from a vertex in layer i. Uh, labeled a comma b 
to a vertex in layer I plus one representing the configuration change or the memory state change after seeing that sample. So each non-leaf vertex has two to the n prime plus one uh, outgoing edges, one for each a comma b, or the one for each possible sample. So this is a completely general description of any algorithm that uses memory, uh, you know, log d. Yeah. And the samples, uh, so, so, so basically you are now, you, now you're given a stream of samples. How do you, how do you uh, tra traverse this branching program? You start at the start vertex, see the first sample, go to a vertex in the second layer, and then last layer after seeing the empty sample, uh, or to a vertex in last layer. So this, so this path, this path taken by the stream of samples in this branching program is defined as a it defines a computation path. Um, it is it is a, it's called a computation because path because not all the all paths will correspond to a, a computation uh, of, of a learning algorithm. And then each vertex in the last layer is labeled by f hat v, where output, uh, where when you reach this vertex in the last layer, you will output this. Uh, 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 output this uh, function as your guess for the unknown function f. And then the success probability is defined as the probability that a computation path reaches a vertex v uh, and the probability that f hat v is equal to f. So as you can see that what, what would be interest, what would be uh, what would what we would want to keep track of is this p f given b that is the distribution of f conditioned on the event that the computation path reaches v. So here the probability the probability space is uh, is the stream of samples and the unknown function f which was chosen from the randomly from the concept class and the sam and I have already told you how the samples are chosen and so then you look at all the computation paths that reach V and then compute what is the probability that the unknown function was F condition on the fact that you reach this v, vertex V. And then uh, we, uh, we define this vertex V to be a significant vertex if this belief distribution PF given B has high L2 norm. So it, it, it might not be necessary to see uh, what this means mathematically, but intuitively this means that you are close to guessing what the correct F is. And then, uh, 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 then you look at the probability that the path reaches uh, a significant vertex V. So we prove that if V is significant, then the probability of reaching V is exponentially, uh, exponentially small in uh, K times L. And then if there are less than two to the order K L vertices in the branching program, then with high probability, by union bound, we will reach a non-significant vertex. And because a non-significant vertex has low L2 uh, norm, uh, has a belief distribution that has low L2 norm, you would not be able to guess uh, the uh, F correctly because there are just too many, too many uh, possibilities of F that reaches this uh, vertex. Uh, so Mega? Yeah. The uh, statement that you put it, uh, K and L are parameters, or these are the K and L you told us in the beginning uh, that, uh, you know, that, um, uh, they are chosen in advance given the, uh, the discrepancy bounds on your matrix. Yeah, so it's like K is like some gamma times uh, K, K, so which, which I'm, uh, uh, Taking into the omega. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, right now uh, here now it is. Yeah. This is. These are the parameters that uh, are given in the matrix, namely that uh, any any fraction two to the minus l of the columns and two to the minus k of the rows is a submatrix with a, a very good uh, discrepancy. Yeah. Okay. C can I also ask a question? Yeah. Uh, 
the definition of a significant node, the two to the minus n is one over the size of f, you mean? Sorry, can you repeat the question? When you define a significant vertex, there is a two to the minus n. Yeah. This should be one over the size of f? Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's expectation of the size of f. So if f is a probability distribution, then it's two to the minus n. The, so it was, if it was a uniform distribution on all functions, like in the beginning, it would be two to the minus n, right? So it is, so, so here is, so there is some uh, normalization. So this PF given V is expectation uh, over, uh, uh, over F, uh, uh, PF uh, given V is uh, uh, the, the pro P of F square. So, so, so then for uniform distribution, this is exactly two to the minus N. And then we see that how much does, did it increase by a factor of two to the N. So you're considering only two to the n functions, and and because yeah. at some other point you had a, a, a more abstract uh, version, like a general f. Here you're just having you have two to the n columns in your matrix. You can call n. Uh, you can call two to the n the size of the function class. Yeah, this is the okay. It's, I'm just trying to understand. Thank you. I actually, sorry. Yeah, so then uh, I'm not clear on whether it's the size of the dough, the number of inputs to F or, or the. No, so the it is the size of the concept class F. Number of inputs to F is two to the n prime. Okay. I think the point is that uh, you take the smaller of the two, whatever uh, whatever it is. I mean, uh, it may be that describing the function is longer or describing the samples is longer. I mean, this this n, uh, right, Omega, correct me if I'm wrong, this uh, No, so this n is just the size of the concept class. Two to the n is the size of the concept class. Regardless if there are fewer samples or... Uh, yeah, even if there are fewer samples. So that if there are fewer samples, what it will show into the bias parameter to do the R. Oh, I see. So it will show in the bias parameter. It always takes the um, size of the concept yeah. class. Okay, got it. Yeah, thanks. So the so so we base, but we basically prove that the probability that the path reaches a significant vertex is small under the uh, uh, definition of truncated path, which is same as a computational path, but it stops when atypical things happen. So the, these are the things which we, which we do not want to happen. And then if these things happen, we just accept, okay, uh, we accept defeat and we would, uh, uh, if we keep on going on in, on this computational path, or if we, uh, or or for these these set of f's, we will uh, output a correct answer. So we just stop, and then under this truncated path, we prove that uh, the probability of uh, reaching the significant vertex is small. Uh, so one of these atypical things uh, is, for example, bad edges, which are a set of samples A, where A is chosen from this capital uh, sample class capital A. And then, uh, so, uh, so this uh, all us that if uh, you are, at, if given the belief to have this belief distribution PF given V, now if, the, if a function is, the, is chosen from this belief distribution, then you will be able to predict what uh, M A comma uh, F is uh, uh, with non-negligible probability. So these are bad samples. Where so why is it a bad sample? Because if you so basically you predicted that okay 
okay it is going b is going to be 1 with probability 3 by 4 but now you see that b is minus 1 then you are getting a lot of information about what the unknown function f is and your belief dis distribution will uh, will get uh, will get narrowed down uh, by too much and we do not want it so that's why you just stop at these bad edges uh, when you are going to traverse and you'd never traverse them and then you saw that the probability that a path stops is exponentially small and if it is not stopping you will reach a non significant vortex so then to show that uh, uh, that you the probability that you reach a non significant uh, a significant vortex is small we uh, we use the same progress function as defined by uh, in ran's paper in 2017 and this progress function so let s be a significant vortex so s is a vortex in uh, uh, uh in the, in the branching program and then you define a progress function with respect to each uh, vortex s uh, as follows so for every layer i you you this z i basically represents how close is this layer i to reaching the significant vortex s and can then you, can you give some intuition about why the inner product is why why you chose k to raise the inner product to the, yeah so that's a good question so basically so it's it's basically comes here you want a you want an exponent you want that the probability of reaching this vortex is exponentially small in k times l and then this k parameter is chosen such that uh, such that your pro you can show that the progress function is uh, is very small uh, progress is very small and the it is the maximum case such that the uh, these bad bad events would not affect the progress function by too much so for example if you uh, um if you did not have this uh, so maybe i I'll, i'll explain these three points first and then uh, come back to the question so for example in the starting this uh, uh, pf given v is just uniform distribution and then uh, uh and then you can show that uh, the in the starting you are very far from reaching s uh, the a significant vortex and then in the starting this progress function is just of the value 2 to the minus 2 and times k and then we show with using the extractor property that zi grows very slowly uh, at every time step and then you show that if s is in a layer then uh then it it because s is in the layer it uh, it this layer is close to reaching s unless probability of s probability of reaching s is small so that means that uh you show that uh the probability of uh, reaching s is uh, uh, at most 2 to the minus uh, l times k and so so basically you need this uh, you need it to be exponentially small in the product so that you can do a union bind, bound over all the vertices and then if you did did not raise to the power k you would not get this exponentially small in the product of l times k So, so my guess the last point is uh, you use the union bound to so the the third point uh, what what does it follow from So the third point just follows from that uh, the, s is a uh, s is high l2 norm So 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 this this quantity for pf given s times pf given s uh is is large and then zm is large and then you upper bounded by basically this and then these things cancel out and then you have probability of s is small okay so as long as as long as m is sub exponential uh the the you know the change in zi is so slow that uh, uh even after m steps you are roughly Zm will be the same as z zero. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so basically you, you improve, you, this improves by each step. So you need M to be less than two to the R. R where R was the parameter of that matrix. So then if, if uh, so basically this proves that if S is significant, then probability of reaching the S is exponentially small in K terms. Uh, Tony, if you, uh, do you have more question? Um, yeah, I'm still a little, I mean, I understood why you, you did the, the L before, because that was like, I mean, L was like uh, L by K, right? That was the, the, the dimension of the thing that has good lo low discrepancy. Yeah. So, um, so I understood why the probability, you know, in the last slide, it was two to the L to, over two to the N. Yeah. Um, because that's kind of when, when you want to stop. But, but now this, this, and I know that you always have to raise this to the thing to get the, you know, to be able to go for a really long time. But it's, I'm just, it's just not so intuitive to me. Even even before before it was lopsided, when the, when it was a square thing, I still didn't really understand yeah. this trick. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so uh, I can. I, I see that it works, but I just. But maybe you can say why the, why uh, the second point is true um, yeah. uh, with this measure, or maybe well, just some intuition of why it's true that this measure uh, when you have k there as an exponent, and you have the discrepancy of your matrix. Let's say it was the Hadamard matrix. Uh, you know, so linear size sets, uh, K is linear and, and L is linear in N, and you know that the discrepancy R is also linear in N. Why do you get uh, slow change? So slow, you mean that basically uh, between ZI and ZI plus one, there is an additive, um, you know, just an additive exponential uh, something exponential in in about n squared. No, I don't think it's n squared. It's well. Well, n times n times k. I mean, this is what z yeah. zero yeah. is, and you yeah. want to apply it uh, also after n steps. So it should be something like two to the omega n squared, even after sub exponential number of samples. Yeah, so so yeah, so uh, to the first point that Avi said, so basically now to say that like it it increases it increases slowly, uh, you look at the instead of layer i plus one, you look at layer uh, the uh, the edge layer, the edge layer, uh, the next layer, and then you basically are taking expectation over the edges, uh, uh, p f v given e. And then the maximum this can, because we are stopping at bad edges. So you cannot, your belief, your belief distribution will at most become like the probability at any function F will at most become twice as the probability it was at PF given V. So basically this, this factor can at most increase by two to the K. And then we want that this two to the K should not affect are, are zi so that's why you have that at most the, you can handle two to the there would be at most two to the minus like uh, 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 k fraction of uh, uh, of rows such that uh, such that this is two to the k otherwise it is just like one plus two minus r two two to the minus r to the k. So, so ideally you would want this, the increase in this to be one plus two to the R, minus R to the K. But, but now, uh, uh, but, but it, it, there are cases where it will increase by two to the K and you want to say that these are, these are, the, you, you can, you can handle those. So, the, so then the Mac, the, so that, uh, so the upper bound on K comes from this fact that there are, uh, you can only guarantee that there are uh, there are two to the minus k fraction of uh, uh, rows which which show this. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so okay, so so for now, uh, th this is uh, all. This is all that I want to say about this proof. And for the next fifteen minutes, uh, uh, I want to talk about. Uh, 
uh, a, a result on two pass learning, uh, which, which came last year. So, so, so in the, in the two past learning, for example, we will still consider the toy example of parity learning. Uh, uh, again, the F is, uh, F is a, a, a randomly chosen end bit string and is unknown. And then a learner tries to learn F from a stream of samples uh, of the form uh, A is uh, of, a, of the form A comma B, where A is another randomly chosen end bit string and B is in a product of A with F. But now you are allowed to go over the stream the second time. So basically a learner tries to learn F from the sequence of samples where first it sees the first M samples and then it again sees those uh, M samples. So the, the lower bound that we prove is that any two pass algorithm for parity learning of size N either requires N to the 1.5 memory bits or two to the square root N number of samples. And uh, 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 so be, and we we prove uh, these uh, uh, these lower bounds for uh, for any learning problem corresponding to uh, a matrix which has the extractor property as uh, seen uh, uh, a few few slides back. <clears throat> uh, so I want to mention that we do not have a matching upper bound, and I do not expect to there to be a matching upper bound. We should be able to prove that. It either requires n square memory or to the exponential number of samples, uh, but the our techniques uh, uh, we weren't able to prove it. So, uh, so again, uh, uh, to prove this, uh, we we model the learner as a branching program, and now the branching uh, it is it, it is a two pass uh, branching program uh, of length two m where the first m layers uh, correspond to the part one of the branching program and the second uh, and the second set of m layers correspond to the part two of the branching program where we are reading the uh, samples again and then again you start from a vertex in the uh, first layer and then go and then reach a vertex in the uh, in the in the, at the end of the part one and then you go over the stream of samples again and then you reach a uh, reach a vertex at the end of the part two of the branching program. So, uh, so I would not. Uh, so the yeah. so the proof is yes. a bit. Mega, can you go back? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the main point is that in part two there is no randomness in uh, in B B one has to be the same answer to A one as it was before. Right, that's what makes it difficult. Yeah. 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 Also, uh, can I ask another question, or maybe this will help? Um, also, a one is not chosen uniformly at random. That is also a problem. It's just like you just repeat the same sample. Repeat right? the same. But but so the yeah. upper bound for Gaussian. Elimination. So, do you know how many passes that needs? Yeah, that's a good question. It looks like it looks like n. No, I mean they, they are parallel algorithms, but uh... I, yeah, I'm not, I don't think it like it. It, you you can do it in like we do not have any uh, non-trivial algorithm that does it in n passes. But it, but shouldn't there be something that like some trade-off between the, the memory and the passes? Like there should be some. Yeah. So I so 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 I have to think about this again. But I think in n to the log n passes you can do. Better. Which you mean with with very little memory. With like n memory n n units of memory, but I I have to check again. Okay, sorry for all the interruptions. No, that's good. okay. You get time uh, back for it, Sumaka. So no problem. <laughs> okay. So uh, so uh, let's recall the one pass lower bound uh, where a PF given V was the distribution of F condition on event that the computation path reaches V. And then we define significant vertices such that 
this belief distribution as high L2 norm. And then we prove that the probability that you reach the significant vertex uh, is exponentially small in k times L. But we prove that this probability of reaching uh, probability of reaching v is small under this definition of truncated path, uh, where we stop stop when atypical things happen. And then one of the atypical things was uh, bad edges, uh, such that uh, these are the samples where uh, where you can predict what the uh, uh, what the neck what the b would be with a non negligible probability. Uh, and then we prove that the probability that even if you're stopping at these atypical things, the probability that T stops is exponentially small. Um, uh, but this, 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 this proof that the probability that T is stopping is exponentially small use the fact that uh, this sample A is chosen uniformly at random from 0, 1 to the end or, or this possible set of samples. And then this the first difficulty is that this is no longer true for a vertex v in part two of the branching program. So, for example, in for a vertex v uh, in the second part of the branching program, the set of sample the set of next samples a i might uh, might not at all be uniform uh, a distribution which is uniform over zero one to the n prime. So, for example, the branching program might just remember a one. So you as you reach the second part of the branching program, you know what the next sample would be. And then, so if it is a bad edge, then you do not, you cannot just stop there. You might be stopping it all. Uh, you, uh, you and 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 uh, and uh, uh, hope to prove that you are stopping with probability exponentially small probability. So again, the bad edges, we wanted to stop at bad edges because it was giving too much information about F. And then the save is that because it is a low width branching program, uh, uh, you cannot remember too many of these A's. And this requires uh, definition, defining new stopping rules for the second part of the branching program. And then the second difficulty is that uh, we prove uh, we used uh, we used uh, a technique of a progress function, and in proving that if v is a significant vertex, then probability of reaching there is small. And this also used the fact that uh, a is chosen chosen uniformly at random from zero one to the n prime, because in the extractor property, uh, how you use extractor property to uh, to, to talk about the progress function is, is that you look at the uh, you look at the inner product of PF given V and PF given S, and then you look at the in, this inner product and show that uh, and and think of this as the uh, as a probability distribution, and show that for most of the, for most samples you would not make progress on this on this probability distribution, and this requires that A is chosen uniformly at random. And, and so this, this is a harder problem. And then for, the, and we do not know how to analyze this in a two pass branching program. So the save is that you work on product of two parts, which is a read once or a one pass branching program. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, basically make a, a progress function argument on this product of two parts, which is read once branching program. So, okay. So uh, let's see what what do, what do I mean by product of two parts? So, for example, we had a branching program B, which was part part one of the uh, of the two pass branching program, and part and B prime, which was part two of the two pass branching program. And then uh, we, if it, if these both were length m with the D branching programs, then the product of two parts is a length m with D square one pass branching program and we construct this product as follows. So you look at this branching program and then this is the branching program. And then for, for a vertex in layer I and for a, uh, in B and for a vertex in layer uh, I of B prime, you, you, add, uh, you add a vertex U0 comma U0 prime in, in layer I of uh, B cross B prime. 
but this cannot be everything because you are losing your quadratic edge when you do this, right? So what do you mean by quadratic edge? Wait, wait I mean, you, you are squaring the, uh, or oh, you are just squaring the width. So in yeah, terms yeah, of squaring memory, the... you are just doubling the, you're memory. just doubling the memory. Yeah. Uh, doubling, that's okay, that's allowed. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, no, good question. So then, so then, uh, so basically now for every, uh, you, you take the products of these uh, vertices and then, you, if there was a, a edge labeled a comma b from u0 to u2 and u0 prime to u1 prime, then you have now an edge from u0 u1 u0 prime uh, to u2 comma u1 prime in the product of the branching programs. So now let v0 be the start vertex of the two pass branching program and v1 and v2 be the vertices reached in the end of part one and part two respectively. Then uh, the why is this product of two parts even useful? It is because this event that you go from V0 to V1 and then from V1 to V2, this is equivalent to the event that uh, you start from V0 comma V1 in the product of branch two parts of branching program and then reach V1 comma V2. Um, and so, so because of this, uh, note that this will not be true for any uh, middle vertex uh, or vertex in the middle of the two branch uh, of the uh, of the branch program. It is true only for vertices which are at the which are at the end of part one and part two. And this is this is good because uh, uh, this shows that the belief distribution conditioned on this event is equivalent to the belief distribution conditioned on this event. So you can show that with high probability. Uh, you reach a non-significant vertex uh, for that uh, with respect to this event. So this means that you, uh, the in, in the stopping rules, we can define significant vertex with respect to product of two parts of branching program. And, and then we define bad edges also correspond, uh, also according to the product of two parts of the branching program, uh, events in the two parts of the branching program. But then as argued before, we cannot, we cannot just stop at bad edges. Uh, so then you need to define a new stopping rule uh, or a new uh, criteria for stopping, which are, which are these high probability edges such that now notice that we are conditioning on an event in the two pass branching program. So conditioned on reaching V prime in the two pass branching program while going to from B, uh, while going traversing V and V1 in the middle, conditioned on this event, the, the probability that you, the next sample that you see is A is much higher than the, you, that, uh, than that under uniform distribution. And this we call are the high probability edges. So why do we need this? We want to stop at bad edges unless they are high probability edges, unless they are very bad. Um, uh, and so on, uh, uh, and then, uh, so, uh, so the only thing that, uh, so it, it, yeah, it, it, it might be hard to parse, uh, these stopping rules and, uh, uh, and, uh, what's going on. I, the only takeaway is that some of the stopping rules are defined with, uh, with, uh, with events with respect to two pass branching program, whereas some of the events uh, stopping rules are defined with respect to events in a product of two parts of the branching program. Whereas we want to show that you stop with probability, with small probability only in the two pass branching program, because that is in the end our learning algorithm. So in the end, we want to prove that conditioned on V0 uh, condition on reaching V prime in a two pass branching program, probability of stopping is small. But this, and it is easy to prove under, under a, in a read once branching program as, uh, as done by previous papers, but uh, to go from, to go from uh, an event, uh, event in a product of two parts branching program uh, to an event in the, 
in a, in the two pass branching program this requires technical effort and it uses is proved using single pass result as a subroutine uh yeah uh, this is all i want to say about the proof uh, for the two pass branching program i just wanted to mention some of the difficulties that uh, we face uh, in the uh, while proving such a result <clears throat> cool. Okay, so I have one minute and that is good. Uh, so I want to mention some of the open problems. Uh, uh, so I would be very interested in going beyond the current techniques, for example, proving, uh, proving, uh, proving lower memory sample lower bounds that uh, uh, for, for hypothesis classes that do not have this extractor property uh, or going beyond the parameters that, uh, that uh, uh, beyond the uh, memory sample trade-offs that these parameters give. Uh, so one of the one uh, one of, I, I think one of the good question to answer uh, to get some more techniques is the following: show that any algorithm that learning that learns n bit vector from random linear equations which are correct with probability half plus epsilon requires either uh, n squared by epsilon memory or exponential number of samples. I want to mention that using the current techniques, it is easy to show, it, it follows very easily that you require either n squared by epsilon memory or exponential number of samples. Uh, but I, I think if you can prove a tighter, uh, a tight uh, memory sample trade-off trade -off for this uh, problem, it will give us new techniques to prove uh, memory sample lower bounds. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sumeria, for everybody. Um, okay, let's uh, ask some questions. Anybody? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, so I know that in the two pass case, you were really probably trying to still shoot for the, the same kind of trade off, like exponential number of samples and or n squared memory. But I was just wondering, like normally. Um, in the many past case, you are often you can reduce to number on forehead communication complexity. So like you, like, like if it was two players, you'd partition the, the branching program up into like four pieces where the first player would be looking at, anyways, you, you partition it in some mm -hmm. way so that one of the players had, you know, some chunk of input that it never queried. And then since you can get lower bounds for more than you know, more than two players by by a reduction to discrepancy in the two-player case. I mean, you get a big loss in parameters. Then, you know, usually you can get some kind of branching program, more passes, lower bound. So I just was wondering if that's something you thought about. I mean, I wouldn't get probably would never get exponential many samples, but it would be maybe more passes. Um, like, is there a reason that you couldn't get something easily from kind of those known techniques? Yeah, I, um, I, I guess I haven't thought about these techniques. Um, Somehow it doesn't seem that the one pass case is, is uh, using uh, communication complexity or, or discrepancy directly as it is used in you know, I thought it was. I thought, I thought you literally proved that if the communication, if the matrix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer is that, yeah, you, you do. But the use of discrepancy. Uh, in yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it would be trivial. Program <laughs> is, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I you know, just was wondering. Yeah, there might be something subtle about it, but. Um, that's why I'm asking. Maybe, maybe a question uh, to Sumega, given what Tony is asking. Uh, after having the proof in the case of just one pass, can uh, one view the, the lower bound as a lower bound on some communication protocol of some type between two parties? If, if there was a version of the proof that looked like that, then maybe what Tony proposes uh, for multi-party would work. 
so uh, so the question is that uh, so the can the proof be uh, used uh, can the proof be inspired from communication complexity like from party communication right that as a, a low bound on some communication problem it, it would probably be a different i mean i don't know uh, can it be described in terms of uh, um, some low bound in, in publicity communication complexity. That, that's uh, what the uh, low discrepancy matrices give us, right? That's uh, you know, low bounds. But, but it seems that here the low bounds is, is doing much more than just a linear low bound on the number of bits exchanged, right? It's doing something much, you know, I don't know, seemingly much stronger from the same matrix. Yeah, I, I guess I like just like on a on a basic level, I do not know like how to think of it as a communication problem because like the like n samples can give you a lot of information. So it's so you need to do this sample by sample. So maybe exponential number of parties. I, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can talk offline. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, questions to Sumega? I think that there is a, a, a fundamental difference between this and communication complexity. Uh, typically, the communication complexity thing allows to prove lower bounds on the width. Uh, for example, for read once, then you show that the width is huge. The, in this case, the length is exponential. It's read once in a strange way compared to the communication complexity. Yeah, 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 I agree with you, but it doesn't mean you couldn't prove something non-trivial. I agree these parameters you wouldn't get. So it's, can, can I ask more about like the distinction between this? Like, what do you mean by width? Usually width is, What's the difference when you read once in a different way? I think he's saying the memory, usually you, um, the length is like pretty short or the number of samples, but the mm -hmm. width, you're trying to prove a big width, memory bound. Is that right? Oh, so the okay. usual reduction of a branching program to communication complexity is yeah. just split the program in the middle, give uh, the inputs from the left to one player and the right to another player and ask them to compute the function. But this cannot be done here because, uh, um, yeah. So, so I guess maybe you want like n, n square, uh, like you have square root, uh, I don't know, n by two samples and to the first person and then n by two. But, but there's these other like communication versions where like the players have the samples. Um, anyways. So okay. maybe that's what Sumega said. Maybe if you have an exponentially many players, this is a good, a better description of what. Uh... Yeah. More questions. <clears throat> uh, I'm just uh, wondering for three passes, you cannot do. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like or something. Nothing. No, it's like a technical place, basically to. Uh, to prove, oh, wait, what happened? So basically here, uh, so there's a problem with, uh, uh, with saying that like, what kind of events can you do union bound? Because you cannot do union bound on a probability of stopping. And then, so basically you want that the, uh, like the, the path up till here is independent of the path here, which is no longer two for more branching program, a bigger uh, two, three pass branching program. So it's like a technical difficulty. And a, uh, similarly, you cannot even prove uh, instead of two paths, you can do, uh, um, well, the, the a standard generalization of read once programs is read twice programs you cannot, uh, can you lower bound this as well, or it has to be a two pass in the same order? Yeah, it has to be a two pass in the same okay. order. 
because of like you take product of these branching programs so right. it won't be different okay any more questions oh, so that's thanks to mega again okay thanks a lot thank you thank you